Launchpad has now been around for three seasons and coaches everywhere are saving time and being more efficient when it comes to scout cards. Coach Robinson from Texas says, the thing I most enjoy is the ease of access to all the scout cards and how I can draw on them if I need to make any changes. Every coach that uses it says that it is so great to use. If you and your staff are tired of the old ways of preparing and using scout cards, check out thecoachpad.com to start enjoying scout team and making the 2023 season better than ever. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Gap Down Backer Podcast. Uh, today we have uh, Coach Mike Craig. He is the defensive coordinator at Duquesne University over there in Pennsylvania. Coach, how are you doing? I'm doing well today. Thank you for having me. No problem, Coach. Um, kind of before we get started, uh, do you want to give uh, our listeners slash viewers um, kind of your background and how you ended up being the D.C. at Duquesne? Yeah, so uh, Western PA native uh, out of Pittsburgh, played for great high school coach Bob Pelko. I was fortunate to play in three state championship games, only won one of those. I uh, was recruited by Dave Ofar, a uh, Penn State grad. He was the head coach of St. Francis University in, uh, in Loretto, PA, Central PA. Played four seasons there. Uh, coached four years under him right after that. Was pretty fortunate to step into a full-time role right away. Um, then went to Duquesne for four seasons, linebackers, safeties, special teams. Um, went back to my alma mater as defensive coordinator for two. Uh, then through contacts, I uh, was at California PA for six se- five seasons, six years. And then I uh, just got back to Pittsburgh where Coach Schmidt was the head guy for my previous time at Duquesne. And, and uh, defensive coordinator resigned and I was able to slide right in there. And, and uh, you know, back in Pittsburgh where I'm home, was home for me. And I've been fortunate ever since be on good programs. Good coach. And, and kind of, I mean, I mean, you just mentioned that there's, there's been some stability at the top there at Duquesne. How did that make the transition? Oh, let me rephrase that. How did, did it make the transition easier um, coming back? Or, I mean, how did that work uh, for when you made your transition back to Duquesne and there just been some, I mean, does it help to have that long-term stability and familiarity as you come back? No doubt. I think it's important in in programs that stability, you know, not only I knew coach Schmidt and I knew what he was about and how he runs his program, but, um, you know, stepping in and and for me personally, I probably changed more, you know, in my time getting away from there and coming back. So it was, uh, you know, it was good learning process. I, I respect coach Schmidt, you know, and how he goes about his business as a head football coach. And, uh, so that made it easy. I knew it kind of knew what the expectation was. I knew what, he believes in and the, the foundations he built his, pro, his program off of. And, you know, so it made it easy. I mean, there was familiarity there and, and uh, you know, Duquesne been fortunate to have success in recent years. And I think stability is a big part of that. You know, there's a, there's a consistency with the coaches. There's some, some guys that have been there for a, a long time and um, is allowed for success and not only in recruiting, but it also helps for the alumni, you know, guys that graduate to be able to come back when the head guy's been there 18 years, there's a lot of, familiar faces and, and names that have come through Duquesne and are been doing great things now as, as alumni, but they feel welcome back. You know, they know what the program's all about and where it's, where it's grown. And the, the, I think he's going into his 18th season. So he's seen a lot of growth from, you know, D3 to that mid-major level to the Northeast Conference and adding scholarships in that program. So who's part of that whole transition there? So, you know, he's seen that program grow over his years to play in Florida state and Hawaii last year, which is, is unbelievable from where they were when he took the job. Yeah. Now also like, cause you've been able to pop at a couple different places, all fairly regionally the same. Mm-hmm. I mean, how, how has your defensive before we get into some of the defensive stuff that I want to talk yeah. to that, how has your defensive philosophy evolved over the course of your career? Um, you know, I was, like I said, I was, I was fortunate when I started coordinating, um, you know, I was, I got very blessed with some young coaches that we were on a staff together and we were all kind of first timers and we were going through it and, but they were grinders, you know, I think we hit kind of a right spot with uh, some young coaches. We all had, you know, significant others, but none of us were married. Or I just got married. We had no kids. So we were able to put in some good hours early on and really develop a system that, 
Um, we spent a lot of time to make sure we get our terminology right and, and, uh, and able to grow. And it's, it's continued to grow off of that. And those guys are now coordinators of their own, you know, and, and doing their own thing systematically within some sort of structure. But then to go from St. Francis to Cal and kind of start again with a new install with a new group of guys, you know, we just continuously clean up our teaching processes and, and installations to help clear up communication and in our minds, hopefully make it simpler for the players. Um, and, you know, try to speed up the learning curve when you do transition defenses. And that's kind of where we were at at Duquesne was, um, you know, new a D coordinator was there for a long time. So it was a change of system for some guys and, and just philosophy in general, right? But, you know, terminology changes. Um, so we kind of going through that transition it made it easier. And every time it gets, you know, you, you get better and better every time you do it from scratch again uh, with what you want to get accomplished and ultimately changing, simplifying the overall philosophy of what we want to do defensively, you know? So if you're focused on tackling or focusing on certain things, you know, where you want to start from and what principles you got to get into place before you really get into scheme, so to speak. Now, like, I, like we, we, we were able to connect because of a mutual friend um, as I was mm -hmm. as I'm kind of pick picking people's brains on various defensive things. Um, why want, I mean, you're primarily a one high team, um, right. cover three, I mean, whatever you want to call it. Why is that, why that instead too high? Why middle field closed instead of middle field open? I mean, you can work, I can work it however I want, but why is that your personal preference on how to play defense? At the game? Yeah, I think, um, you know, one, it obviously puts you in a great situation to handle run game. Um, you know, in those numbers. But I, another thing is, as offenses continue, you know, I think off, first off, I think offenses are unbelievably challenging. Um, they do great things schematically to, whether you're too high, one high, you know, to get you in some compromising situations and as a defense. And, you know, one high or ability to um, cover receivers up in the RPO game and, and kind of limit some of those throwing windows as I, the more I do it is more of the reason why I like it. You know, I, I like the thought of pressure when I initially started it, the idea of blitzing guys and being able to be very multiple with your pressure package was my getting into it was what I really loved about it. You know, and as it's evolved, as offense has evolved, I like the matchups better on the perimeter as you get in those four receiver sets. And, um, you know, it's just a lot, it allows us to, to be a little more flexible in recruiting you know, small college ball where we're able to find some tweener positions that uh, body types that we're able to plug and play in different roles, you know what I mean? And get, and get some more personnel on the field to, you know, being in a, in a package type system with recruiting and guys, we're able to get more players involved, you know, and, and, you know, we obviously need to be good at corner in the, in those types of things, but it helps focus our recruiting a little bit more and, and be a little more specific and, uh, we're able to find more players, honestly, in the recruiting process that that can fit our scheme and find a role within our defense. Now, I curious question. I've had this talk with a couple people now because I'm seeing, and, and I don't know if I, I don't know why I haven't realized it before this year because I've played with the two high stuff. I've done, and I probably have had more success with one high as much as I've have fought it over the years. Yeah. Um, just. Like from install perspective, like it seems to me, and I could be completely wrong about this, but talking to people this off season, covered and, and, and it's also partially for scenes, two high people really teach their systems as here's this coverage, here's this is what you do in this coverage. Whereas one high guys are more outside the corners, here's what everybody does. So depending on how we align, who's where you understand you might be the curl seam player. You might be the strong hook, weak hook. How do you approach installing your coverages to your kids? Is it which, which um, mode do you kind of focus on? I, I think that's a pretty good assessment, to be honest with you, of how you, you know, you're globally thinking there. Um, yeah, we're very, we teach more, we, you know, underneath coverage techniques. We kind of teach through that curl flat seam play, hook curl play, regardless of position. You know, we teach more from, hey, these are the principles of these coverages and then expand upon that. Right. So in by by rule, by technicality, we are a quarter, quarter, half base structure, which I still treat as one high. 
you know, you're still three deep. It's a different capacity. And then <laughs> you build, base it off of that traditional four, four cover three mentality, that shell of a four, four cover three. And then, you know, mix and match. Hey, this is how we get to this. This is how we get to this. And you kind of build and expand upon those base principles of, of old school cover three, curl flat force play to hook curl play strong and weak. And then, you know, and then, and then as you expand upon the coverage, how quarter, quarter, half and cover three turn into one thing, because there's a lot of similarities in them. So we're able to get to different rotations and things like that and really expand upon that. But to me, the, the foundation of what we do is our players understanding really what hook curl play is from a run fit perspective and then expanding upon that and how, you know, and with that, like I was, I tell any coach that works under us, like, hey, we, we know we're a one high team. So teams are going to focus on one high. Offenses are going to focus on one high beaters and one high things that we have to be prepared for as the season goes on. So we spend a lot of our work and coverage addressing the one high attacking team, you know, offenses and whether that's route concepts or run game things to get us in bad positions. And that's really where we start from those kind of worst case scenarios for us. And then we build a rule basis off of that and so on and so forth. And it just keeps expanding as we change rotations or, you know, do different things. So that, that base principles of quarter, quarter, half and cover three is our starting point for okay. everything. Now, now, when you say you start with the quarter, quarter, half, and that, like I talked to another coach and I, I was just throwing ideas at him and we were talking about cover three match stuff, ripple mm -hmm. is whatever, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, it's, I mean, obviously the basis is the rip Liz stuff, but other people have taken the cut, his rip Liz and put their own flares on it or simplified it or however you want to look at it. But he, he pretty yeah. much said that he starts with cover one because it teaches all the divider rules and then he moves mm -hmm. to the cover three. Where do you, so it, do you start at the quarter guard half spot? Do you start at match three? Do you start at country three? How do you start your process continuing to look at that? Yeah. So what I what we do in, in the off season is spend a lot of time, especially going back to Duquesne, starting in that spring. You know what? Like I would say, what principles do we need to get taught uh, first? So I look at hey, quarter, quarter, half. You know, what is that for us? That means ultimately globally, we want to be able to match underneath routes and double the over routes. Right. That's how we look at it. And then for cover three, we say, hey, we're going to pass off under routes and we're going to match the over routes. So we kind of get into this over under concept, you know, from a global perspective and what that means. And then we really teach our fundamentals based off of run fits. So, Hey, what does force play mean to us? Why do we align the way we do? Well, it's based off of run fits. And I said, ultimately, why do we want to change our rotations? Um, and I said, that's to, I said, we want to confuse run blocking schemes more than we necessarily want to confuse the quarterback. If that makes sense. You know, we want to, if that wide receiver is blocking the force player, we want to be able to change and manipulate our force player through different rotations as opposed to using it to trick the quarterback in rotation. You know, so our main premise is run fits out of cover three or quarter, quarter, half. That force play, secondary force play, plug and fill are the terms that we use. And then, you know, expand upon that. So run fits, number one, what do they mean based off of whatever coverage we're in? And then. Like I said, if whether you're doing cover three or cover one rotations, it's that principle. So if we're three, four base, you know, we look at quarter, quarter, half as a weak side rotation. And we look at cover three from a base perspective as a strong side rotation. When we get into sub packaging, we look at cover six is still weak side rotation. And then that nickel in the game makes cover three a weak side rotation. So, you know, that's the general picture that we're going to start with from a base to sub packaging. And then adjust obviously adjust from that based off of pressures and then get into that rip liz match concept off of those rotations now, now you mentioned teaching run fits there now obviously there's a lot that's done independent study meetings walkthrough wise but from a like when you actually get into the practices how do you focus on teaching the run fits is it is it the primarily the walkthrough setting is there a like a run fit circuit how do you attack that concept of understanding the run fits because obviously I, th I think about at any level um if you can't stop the run it doesn't really matter just like i mean we say all the time like exactly. it, it's great like ohio high school football like 
you can run the air raid all you want, and that's that's great. But um, mm-hmm. it's borderline snowing at most state championship games here, and you need to be able to run the football. I mean, yeah. it's not the run. That's just – Marion Local has 13 state championships, and they run the football. So how do you approach teaching those run fits – um, in your core core half and your cover three systems to your kids when you get on the field? Yeah. So our base understanding of run fits will say, Hey, what is, you know, what is the force? We look at force as an area, right? So we teach force play as outside of two inside of number one, you know, and that's kind of our general principle. Secondary force would be outside of one plug plug play would be inside of two fill play would be inside of three. So that's kind of our basis. Um, for teaching run fits and then we talk about all right you're the force player simplest version is number two comes out to block you whether that's a slot or a tight end right we talk about hat placement in that and then we say okay how are they gonna we know if if the balls run to the force player most teams are going to block the force in some capacity so we get into down blocks with a kick out we get into you know if it's any type of perimeter game number one cracking the force player and what that picture looks like and then how that secondary force player gets involved. And then additionally on that, we talk about, hey, what are, what will teams do? Hey, we're, we're matched up, whether it's cover three or one, right? We're matched up one-on-one on the perimeter. Teams are going to run that crack and go, you know, those bubbles and goes and things of that nature and how that high safety gets involved to help those types of pictures. So as we look at it, hey, this is the area we want to defend as a force player. This is the area we want to defend as a secondary force player here's the looks we can get. And then we really focus on how do we handle block destruction as we get further away from the ball, you know, so how could, how does a force player take on number two blocking him when he's a tight end, when he's tight to the core versus when he's extended from the core and how that force area. So you can, you can still run fit outside of number two when he's extended because he's so far away from the ball, if they run the football. So you may be able to set the force from an inside too, you know, so we really focus on the block destruction in different ways that we can manipulate number two to put ourselves in position to tackle. And as in a, in run fit world, we always talk about positive leverage um, versus negative leverage. So um, just for example, I'm a force player. I'm outside leverage on number two and balls coming to me and that tight ends blocking me. Just take that visual, you know, outside zones coming at me, that tight ends blocking me. So by rule, I'm in my area, right? I'm outside number two. I'm in the force area. How do I defeat that block? What are the what are the tools that I can use? Because I'm in a negative leverage situation. So negative leverage to me is the blockers in between me and the ball carrier, as opposed to positive leverage, which would be like a slant or something, right? And I get inside the blocker and the ball's inside. So do we always talk about positive and negative leverage in the run game? And then what tools we can use. So if I'm a force player, two's blocking me, if I can push the, the number two vertical, that makes me a two-way player, even though I'm force. So I say, hey, we're outside of number two. If the ball is going to get outside of number two, it better go negative. It better bounce negative. So that block destruction requires some sort of vertical push that if it does get outside of me, it's got to go vertical. So that allows us to play aggressive on number two and force play, you know, not really teaching it, hey, outside arm free type mentality. We're talking more about how do we defend the area different ways based on what the blocking scheme looks like. You know, and ultimately give those guys, I don't want those guys to be robots in that situation and, and play, you know, heavy with the outside arm free. I want them to have the ability to make plays, you know, as an, I look at like an outside linebacker. I think here's a guy that does it obviously so well is TJ Watt. If you watch him play and play the edge, he pushes the play vertical and then falls underneath and makes tackles as an edge player. And I, that, like, that concept to me sticks out as an edge player. I'm an outside linebacker. I can just hold the edge and never be involved with the play, or I can create my own opportunities by creating some sort of vertical push um, to allow me to play underneath or be a two gap type player in those situations. So, you know, for me, and just in the years doing it, giving those guys clear rules, right? Now I always tell those force guys, you're never wrong to be outside of number two. If that if you play that, that's winning football. Um you know, and then ultimately the separator between guys is who's the has the ability to play outside of number two and then create their own opportunities based off of block destruction. And then our focus is totally on handling those blocks and all those different scenarios in in the run game. And then, you know, then you build to the 
pass game off of that type of action, whether it's play action, RPOs, things like that, and how they can manipulate. Uh, you also, I mean, I'll, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll go this way first before I go that way. Um, before I get into, like, specific positions and some other things, um, the – obviously, I, a fall practice is a fall practice, but um, early on in camp or in the spring, what does a typical defensive practice look like for you? Um, obviously, we've talked a little bit about the run fans, but just in general, how do you typically, or especially early on as you're doing a lot more teaching instead of game prep, um, what does a typical schedule look like from you from a practice point? Um, so we will always start out practice. We call it our main thing. So we always say keep the main thing the main thing, and that that's for us is run tackle takeaways. So if you look at – if you ask anybody that's played in our system in the last four years and you ask them what the main thing was, that's exactly what they would tell you, run tackle takeaways. And what we say there is no matter what the situation is, if we can do those three things, we're going to put ourselves in a good situation. If we fail to do those things, regardless of what the call is, regardless of what the situation is, we won't be playing winning football. So uh, run the opportunity, you know, be a good tackler technique wise. And then when we teach our tackling, we teach ball awareness within our tackling. So our practice will always start out with the main thing drill. It's the first five minutes of practice where we're working we, we focus on two different types of tackles, ball two, ball away. Some people call it profile. Some people, you know, different different terms for it. But we'll always start, each position coach will have a drill that they're working. Um, and then we work a, a block destruction thing within that. So we have ball awareness drills. Tack, so every tackling position, we're going to incorporate a ball and work on how we punch and strike and have different philosophies on that stuff but that'll always be the first thing we do before we stretch, before we do anything, we're going to work through that tackling circuit and ball awareness drill, our main thing circuit, um, which is really five stations that we're working with. Um, it is part of our warm up. It's very focused. It's one rep per guy at each station and it moves pretty quick. And then we jump into um, stretch or whatever we got going on for that day team wise. And then my philosophy for individual drills is coaches figure out what movements that our positions do the most. Um, and highlight those movements. So, for example, hook curl, hook curl play. There's a way that the body moves that we have to be efficient in. Okay, so we talk hook curl. I'm just going to kind of focus on hook curl and backer play just to give an example. So hook curl, when your number two is extended versus your number two in the core, it changes your body movements um, and your, your how your feet should be positioned in your stance. And then that key is going to tell you your post snap reaction. So we do a lot schematically. We're very multiple. So our guys technique wise need to be very simple, right? So we're going to put a lot of pressure on teams by our multiplicity, but our technique teaching is very simple. So similar to our run fits, Hey, hook curl player with two extended, you're a fill run fit, what we call an alley fill fit. So two's extended one back look, What's your read? Here's the movements that are based off of that read. And we put that read on a vision. So we start to drill with just the movement piece. No, no key, right? We're just focusing on how your feet move. Hey, run look. This is what your feet look like. Pass game. This is what your feet look like. Then we incorporate the reads off of that and continue to stack out our indies. And so, hey, run fits with the key. Pass reads with the key to a visual key off of the receiver. You know, we just expand and we slowly expand that picture for them as the individual period goes on. So every coach has, you know, their, their everyday movement drills. Okay. So our safeties are working outside leverage position on two as the curl flat player inside backers are working their hook curl footwork. And that's where we'll start from just that simple movement. So I know, Hey, so what does the stance look like in what we call that alley fill fit? Too extended. What's our stance for that hook curl player look like? How do our feet need to be positioned? How wide? How narrow? Are we all, all our cleats in the ground? You know, it's that simple. And we really try, try to create that foundation early. And this is how the movements that we want to see on tape. And this is how your body has to move. So going back to the original, you know, why cover one or one high shell is we're able to break these components down to these small chunks of techniques 
and then just slowly expand upon them as we involve more people into the underneath coverage stuff. So if we, we like going back, you asked, you know, how did it evolve? Like that's where it started from. I can't, I can't remember how we got into our curl flat rules. I just know they came from somewhere and we kept growing on them. And anytime we play a team that changes something for us, we kind of add it to this little dictionary of things. And we just slowly build upon things that hurt us in the past to into our teaching for the next install period. Um, you know, whether it be spring or fall, you know, so we're, we're constantly looking at movements. Um, you know, what does it mean to be same foot, same shoulder? What does it mean to be leveraged appropriately tight leverage, you know, and, and, and on the keys and we're, so when we get into a game or a game plan, we're not necessarily changing our looks. We're changing more of our keys and our alignments and footwork on a week to week basis, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. based off the game plan. So we get pretty detailed with it and, and we focus on those things. And I would, at the end of the day, when we come back to coaching, you know, we're watching tape of practice, our teaching points better be focused around the movements and keys that we're talking about on a daily basis. So, Hey, every time we're in cover three, that backer coach better be talking about hook curl play and the principles around hook curl play. And that's usually where the air lies as opposed to, you know, losing focus of really what we're trying to get accomplished, especially in the spring ball, right? That's the time to really focus in on those techniques and try to master those for players in that time frame. So when fall comes and we do want to install week to week or game plan week to week, we have that solid foundation of what hook curl play actually is and really what we're trying to get accomplished. You know, so it can be pretty deep. It can get heavy detailed at times, which I'm definitely okay with as a defensive coordinator. You know, I think we're, I think we're focused on the right things. Um, you know, it allows us to expand our skill sets and it, it ultimately bleeds into the weight room, um, into our strength and conditioning program. Like, Hey, this is what we ask our backers to do on the field. What can we do in the weight room that translates to this, these types of movements and what we're trying to really get accomplished on a Saturday. I get that. And like, I'm not, I'm not going to say like the two, the two read stuff is not detailed, but I seem to, as I have these conversations, there's a lot more, I, it's probably a bad statement, but oh well. Um, a lot more detail on a lot of the one high stuff. And I think that's just because of the multiple. I think, and I think part of that is you're simple, but at the same time, you're moving people to where multiple people can do it. So it requires a lot more detailed teaching. Whereas you're, I, I don't want to say you're, you, you're able to do a little bit more because everybody's got a specific assignment with too high. Now, the next thing I wanted to kind of uh, move to is you mentioned updating like your terminology or your dictionary, quote unquote, there. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you spend an off season or how much time or however you want to word it? Do you spend each year working on updating your playbook um, and or your dictionary or terminology? Um, how do you how do you approach that every off season? Um, always looking through. So. A lot of I go into the off season from a scheme standpoint and say, what can we eliminate? You know, what do we have too much verbiage around something? Um, you know, where can we simplify? So I'm always on the efficiency train of eliminating terminology and verbiage if we can. Um, that's kind of my first thought process. So again, I think we're pretty efficient now with our underneath coverage techniques and how we teach them. Um, so I'm always looking for ways to simplify even further if we can, you know, where, where's the redundant language coming in where we're maybe teaching the same principle two different ways um, as we expand. So that's number one. And then schematically, it's it's literally going out. It's it's podcasts like this. You know, what are people what's what are people doing? Maybe I hear something at a clinic, you know, that one thing that coaches are always talking about. I see one concept or hear one thing at a clinic and I'm like, man, that's. That's really good. And then me personally, I love watching offensive coaches in the off season. Um, and it's not, I'm not trying to steal stuff or do it. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to be like piggyback and find something creative. Uh, I'm literally just look, I'm listening for what offensive coaches are looking for, um, for success. But, and then, and then I'm looking really to see what is their understanding of coverage, if that makes sense. Um, you know, being around offensive guys, you know, they see, I mean, they just see coverage differently than defensive guys do. I think it's just the nature of both sides of the ball, you know? So I'm always curious to see what are, 
offense is seeing in coverage? Like what's an OC see looking at when he looks at a game film of somebody? What's he what's he really looking at? Is he does he even care about like are we folk putting more emphasis on force players than they are? One high, two high? Are we putting scaring ourselves into thinking there's more to it than there really is? You know, so I'm, I love watching offensive guys. I do that for multiple reasons. One, I, I love listening to install teaching progressions, you know. So you're watching a guy install, you know, his insert zone stuff. Like, what's he looking for? What's his advantages that he sees? You know, whether are they counting sides? Are they worried about the three technique? You know, so I'm always, that's my offseason focus is what our offense is doing on a consistent basis. And I'm sure it's just like defenses, right? There's trends either way, right? That, that, that people are doing, you know, seeing like they're, you're watching – Monday night football and you see something, you're like, whoa, right? Something that catches your eye that's either new or, or innovative in some some way. How are we getting to that? Why are they doing that? That makes sense why they would do that. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm very curious. And I think, you know, we played a couple coordinators this year that I thought did some really good things to attack us. You know what I mean? So I start building that into our rule basis of, hey, this is this is a trend for offenses. We better be prepared to handle this. Is it, is it already in our system? We just got to spend more time on this, you know, portion of it, or do we need to start really changing our rule structure based off what's out there and being exposed, you know? So I love watching, especially late in the season like this, the football that's on, like what are the, these teams that are really successful on offense at this point in the year, what are they doing and how are they attacking people? Um, I think, you know, I think you're seeing more one high stuff defensively um as we as we push forward here but you know that that's really like I, I said I learned more defense by sitting in offensive clinic talks than I have sitting in defensive talks you know how are people attacking things what do they see and uh really try to understand offense you know what are teams doing when they're trying to run outside zone what are they really looking for what are they trying to get yeah like what, what, are, yeah. what are they doing you know um and then how to how to best put our guys in good leverage situations to win you know, and, and where can we, the quarterback run game, right? Where can we get people? Where can we, where are they reading? What are they looking at to see advantages, you know? So that's honestly, and then taking that and saying, Hey, you know, as, as we've grown, you know, we started three, four, we were, we were like 50, 50 base and sub, you know, now we've become, so our base package was really big. And now we play so very little base just because offenses aren't, you know, they're more with single tight ends that we've become very sub driven, you know, we're playing 70% snaps and nickel and dime personnel than we have ever been, you know what I mean? So we're changing, we're adapting to the different offensive personnel, but um, you know, we still have that base, our three, four is our base starting point for teaching our coverage and everything that we do. How, and I'll, I'll bounce off that. I don't even know if I, did I even answer that question? Yes, I don't even know if I answered that yeah, question. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll jump off that real quick because that gave me a good idea. It's like, so obviously with the massive chain, obviously that's going to change how you recruit. But from a practice standpoint, um, how has that, since it's become so sub-package driven and so nickel and dime driven, how has that altered how you – it, not even just like practice as a team, but like indie driven. How has that altered your indie over the past couple of years with you getting so much lack of tight end or so many like I'd assume probably heavy trip stuff? How has that altered altered you altered how you approach things? Well, we live in our coverage, right? So we're gonna stick to our coverages early on that, you know, that quarter, quarter, half and that three shell, we're going to stick to that stuff pretty consistent, whether we are base or sub, our emphasis is now just more on the, you know, that 11 personnel um, formation. That's, that's your, really your starting point, right. For everything is that, that 11 personnel look, you know, two by two with that Y off the ball is our starting point from a run fit perspective, as opposed to a tight end, two backs, you know what I mean? So we're already starting to start our, our run fits out of that look first, as opposed to a traditional pro team, like we would have six years ago, you know? So we just kind of, we kind of bypass that real, that true two back run game. Now I'm always a big believer in this. If you don't see it in camp, you're going to have a hard time replicating it as the season goes on. So if, if you know, there's a two back team coming down the pipe in your season, you better have that. You better get some of that stuff on tape during camp or else it's going to be foreign 
foreign territory when it gets, you know, week six and you're playing that pro style team and, and you haven't prepared for it uh, much like two tight ends. If you're not prepared for two tight ends early, hard to, it's hard to make adjustments in the week and guys just aren't used to seeing that, you know, that, that two on the ball, those two long sides, you know, it's going to be hard to, to capture that in a week. So I said, we were, we opened with Florida State this year. We were pretty fortunate that they were they were big two tight end team and then eleven personnel. So we were able to hit those things heavy in camp. And as the season went on, we played a lot of teams that were in that world of two tights and three receiver sets. So we had a good foundation for the year of what we'd see formationally um, to be able to get good work in in preseason. But uh, yeah, it's it's the same thing. You know, I think the biggest learning curve is guys. Obviously, terminology when you when you transfer scheme, you know that the language, but ultimately it's getting them to understand. Hey, what what formationally, whether it's two by two with two tight ends or two by two extended, you know, four wides picture. How do those formations marry? Yeah, it's different personnel, but how do they marry to what we want to get taught? You know, and guys seeing that kind of big picture, big philosophy of what two by two cover three football looks like, reduced or extended is is the concepts that guys that were as the season went on we got really good at you know those guys starting to understand that big picture of the scheme and, and not necessarily how the people match within that but you know I, I think it's the coach's job to put the players in good matchups um but ultimately the guy the more understanding guys have of what offenses are trying to do you know i said hey we're a one high team you can bet your butt people are going to try to get four verts on us some way you can bet your butt people are going to run wheel routes on us. You can bet your butt there's going to be double moves. Like those are things that we know are coming uh, when we're single high and we're matched up like that. So those are obviously huge emphasis in our early teaching. Like, hey, you're corners, you're going to get attacked. It's going to happen. You know what I mean? It's going to, they're going to come after you. Um, you know, so it's again not to be redundant, but that that base teaching of those underneath techniques and those run fits are critical. You know, I, I even teach the mode of like, Hey, what does that secondary run force mean to you in the past game? Right. When they, when they throw a hitch out in the flat, what does that run fit look like? You know, it's no different than them running a ball and they crack block. It's all the same. It's just extended from the line of scrimmage, you know, so really use a lot, utilizing those definitions around run fits to help understand the pass game and distribution of routes within that, regardless of coverage. Okay. Now, I, I mean, you mentioned a lot of hook, the hook curl a lot. Mm. I'm curious from a DB perspective, mainly the two corners and and your middle of the field safety for when you do do your rotations. How do mm -hmm. you and, and you've coached safety? Um, how do you one, how has that evolved? And then two, I mean, when you're approaching the cover three stuff, especially the corners, how are you teaching them? Is it is it a lot more of the Nick Saban uh pretty much mess man everything except shallow or is it more the kind of more zone pattern match um where it's if i get two in my zone i split the difference um and not try to overload to one side too quickly yeah so we um obviously multiple versions of three right so if we're let's talk about our base principle right now so i think it's critical for corners and say anybody in that, that back end, take the backers out, that, those back four cover guys or five, right, to understand, hey, anybody that's extended from the core, you know, so all the receivers that are standing up, we're the cover guys, we're ultimately responsible. So if there's four out there, there's four of us that are responsible for them, or five of us that are responsible for those extended guys. So we kind of teach from, for teaching from the back end front, you know, back forward, I'd say, hey, corners, okay, their biggest understanding is what do I do when number one goes under, right? Number one runs the shallow. Is he mine or is he? am I passing the zones? That's the first principle they got to understand, right? Now, different threes will match up differently. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll, then that's, that's how we vary it. You know, we change how we handle number one under in different capacities. So for the corners, I'm saying, hey, understand if number one drives across the formation. Are you taking him? Or are you pushing the coverage, right? That's like their principle to understand. Um, obviously, if one's vertical, he's ours, right? That's our third. That's the guy we got to own. But when one starts to distribute routes and they start running, you know, smash concepts and this and that, how do we distribute those routes and who has what is ultimately what we want to get taught. So 
you know, we basically, we China, no China system, right? China, China, China means corner sloughing off. No China corner is going to play it, right? So we kind of build those principles early on of no China defense versus China defense. Um, and what that means for our hook curl player, or excuse me, our curl flat player and that outside third player, right? So we have our base principles are, hey, corners have one, unless one's under, then we push to number two. Okay, that'd be your base principle. And I say, okay, why is China different? Okay, so one runs a hitch as opposed to driving. You know, one runs a hitch. Is he under or is he over? That's the million dollar question, right? Is he under the backers or is he over the backers on a hitch? So what we, so going back to movements, right? We're going to train that China read for that corner hot and heavy, right? What does that look like? So I say, Corners need to understand quick game is quick game, right? Quick game is quick game. Regardless of what coverage we're in, we're going to play quick game a certain way. And then once I drive on that hitch as if it's quick game, that ball, the ball is either going to be thrown to him or it's not. Typically, if, he, if they're throwing that hitch, it's going to be catch tackle and you got to be ready for it. If you drive on it and that ball is not there, you need to China. We call it MC hammer. You need the MC hammer technique in sync because that high, that high low is on you now. Does that make sense? The high lows on the corner. If you drive the flat, the high route's coming behind you. If you drive the hitch and you, they throw it, that receiver's going to react. You need to be ready to catch tackle. So we really drill that work into that corner. And then, so your field corner, right? The wide side of the field, he's going to be getting a lot of that smash concept, right? Seeing that. And then we talk about high low game where he drives and two runs the dig, um, you know, things like that. And then we just start building that progression, just like we went from a run fit standpoint. We build that progression off of what number one can do, you know. So going back to the hook curl teaching where, hey, this is your this is your picture. This is your key. What are the different things that that key can do to change how your body's going to move? Does that make sense? So yeah. same thing, that quarter, we're going to read number one. We're going to read number one and learn how to play number one. And then you go to week to week and you game plan that field corner. All he has to do is study the number one receiver. How does he run his hitches? Does he align differently for drive routes? Does he push off the ball from vertical differently? So now that focus becomes very narrow on understanding what that number one receiver to the field does and what his route tree looks like, whether if there, is there any pre-snap giveaways? Is there, you know, things that that guy's doing within my key structure that I can adjust to, in the game and, and going back, just really narrowing that focus for that corner so he can play fast and play aggressive. And also when he studies film, he doesn't have to be thinking, man, what's the whole route concept that we're getting? He can isolate on this one guy and really, and then, and I always tell those guys, Hey, when you're watching film, don't just like watch it to watch it. Right. Like that's something you do on a Sunday when you get that new tape is just kind of watch the game and see how it flows, but really get into, Hey, I'm going to watch third down and seven to 10. What's that number one receiver to the field doing in those situations, you know, and start building your playbook in your head of how that guy plays. And I just tell him, I say, pick a coverage three or six and build your read structure off of that. Cause everything's going to be a version of that, you know, and then we look at from a game plan perspective, we look at it the same way as coaches. Hey, this week we want no China scheme on number one, right? We want our corners to take number one because maybe they don't run a lot of smash or maybe they don't run a lot of concepts to the field. Or we don't think the, we want the quarterback to have to throw that corner route over top of that corner, you know, and try to fit that thing in a window, you know. So that's that's how we approach our game plan by those simple adjustments within techniques that are part of our base principles, um, base principle teaching on day one. So one under, how do we handle it? That's what we're looking for for corner play. What do we do when one's not running the vertical route? And second, so I always say we will not get interceptions on our primary key right so i say like corners you're not going to pick off a hitch unless it's really late okay so i would say your your primary read if he's running a route to get the ball you're going to be there to defend it right where you get interceptions is off that secondary read so corner or number one runs the hitch <laughs> corner drives it corner drives it ball doesn't come and then he sloughs off mc hammers out that's his interception opportunity when number two runs the corner route, he drives up and sinks. Those are going to be his interception opportunities. Or when one drives under and two is a little bit late on the dig and that quarterback's trying to jam that in and you squeeze that route, those are your interception opportunities on that secondary coverage principle. So what then what it does for our corners 
is, hey, we're obviously one high. We're going to play a lot of man-to-man, right? So, yeah. like I said, when you get these secondary opportunities, these interception opportunities, you want to capitalize. So that gets them very motivated to become route readers and pattern readers because they know, I, I tell them, they, hey, man, these, this week is going to be a lot of secondary read stuff, a lot of China game, a lot of high-low game on the corner. So you're going to have interception opportunities, but you better rewrite. You better be getting your eyes in the right spot. You know, so it kind of throws that little carrot on a stick for these corners. I said, you know how hard it is to pick off a hitch? Just step in front of a hitch. I'm like, the minute you do it, you're beat for 60, you know, and 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 that's and that's ultimately what we talk about. I say a hitch is a hitch until you miss the tackle. Mm-hmm. Then it becomes a problem. Yep. <laughs> then it becomes a problem, you know. So, yeah, that's how we look at it. So secondary, cover three. What is What do we do when one goes under? And then how do we handle four verts? That's our checklist for our secondary. Hey, are there four vertical threats on the ball? We better have a plan to handle those four verts. Um, so you talked about the high safety, right? Yeah. All right, so let's just picture two by two, right? Yeah. Two receivers, our, our strong curl flat player, we call him our stretch defender. So he's going to be responsible for two vertical, okay, to the field. Free safety or high, how, I'll just call him the free safety, right? Middle of the field safety is going to be reading that two week. Right. If that two weeks pushing vertical, we stay stretched. Right. We're four over four football. That that high safety is going to match the over route from number two week. Right. So his alignment is going to look like it, he's splitting the ones, but it's really technique and off a of two week. OK. Just to give that field side coverage, you were talking about leaning one way or another to the yeah. field. So he's, he's really working off of that weak side. And then we just train his movements based off of what number two does. If two's out, he should do this. Two's under, he should do this. Two vertical, this is what should happen. And then we just build that branch off of, for his technique, off of that look. Um, and then we talk through it out of trips, right? What's the three, two exchanges are going to look like, you know, to that field and how do we handle different things? So, you know, that's how we look at that shell. So, Four receivers on the ball, cover three. Hey, stretch, stretch, stretch. It's us four DBs for these four guys on the ball, right? In some capacity, whether we're matching, whether we're China and on the to the field, playing match to the boundary, whether, you know, it's us four for these four. If they all go vertical, we should all be matched up, okay? Um, if they If anybody's under, we should be zoning off and we should gain a double team somewhere in that realm if that makes sense, right? So now we have four over three once one goes under or somebody goes under the formation, you know? So we just build those principles around that and look to match up based off a of route combination. So going back to corner play in that, hey, what's the China, no China principles? How does that affect the curl flat player? How does that affect the high safety, right? And then you, then you just start building out these formations. They go reduce set, they reduce everybody down, they get real tight. You know, what does that look like? What do vertical rights look like out of that? What do the mesh routes look like off of that? You know, and we just slowly build these pockets of routes. Like I have a, I have a, uh, a route sheet I give to our coaches. It's, it's formational routes that give us the most problems. So like I've been fortunate in the system long enough. I know exactly what routes are going to give conflict, especially early in camp. So like, we know we need to see these route concepts, whether that's in a walkthrough mode you know, some sort of teach mode. We need to see these route concepts because they're going to be the hardest ones that we're going to see on the fly, you know, and that's trips, taking that X and driving them across the formation. When that X drives boundary corner, what are we doing? You know, when you're aligned on that number one, are you taking them or are you pushing the coverage? You know, and we can play it both ways, but we got to know pre-snap what what we're going to be doing, post-snap, what's it going to look like? You know, so there is, like in going back, so we, To be able to do very multiple things in that number one read or that four vertical world, we have to have our principles, like you said earlier, have to be very concrete. You know, what are we trying to go back to? What are we trying to get accomplished in cover three? Right. We want to pass off underneath zones. We want to match up vertically. You know, and it goes back to that. How many different ways can we do that? We can do that a million ways, but we got to understand that base principle of cover three and what we're trying to get accomplished. And ultimately, why do we run cover three to stop the run? <laughs> you know what I mean? So we really get into that that loaded conversation for those guys. And that, that's more philosophical than anything. But, but uh, you know, again, what do we need to practice? What do those things look like? We know, man, OCs are too good. We're going to see something that we didn't prepare for, right? It's going to happen, whether it's something they see within us to attack us. Teams are going to try to attack us, and they're going to do it really well. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we got to be prepared to handle 
the in-game adjustments or what those things look like. So that base understanding of cover three is vital of what we want to get accomplished um, in cover three. And I, and I tell corners all the time, listen, you boxer mentality out there, man, you're going to get punched in the mouth sometimes. You know what I mean? Don't give up a big explosive touchdown. You got to compete out there, but I'll never yell at a corner for getting a ball cut on them. Dude, you're out there competing. Like they, they practice too. They make plays too. You know, just keep competing, keep reading your keys, keep playing football and keep tackling well and things will go our way. You know, the minute you try to get greedy or, or take a shot is when you're going to find yourself in trouble really fast. Okay. And last question I got for you, like when, mm -hmm. so obviously you're very technique driven. Very. In terminology mm -hmm. driven. So especially for like your secondary and your outside backers, the ones who have more of a constant change, uh, depending on what front you're in, what which mm -hmm. variation of cover three you're in, et cetera. What do you get? Do you give them anything? So like I, I, I use a couple examples, like, I have a friend who's the line who's the line coach, uh, Andrew Prevost out at South Dakota. He has a 200 plus page O line manual that he gives to all of his kids. Like, but it's extremely detailed. It has every technique they do. He updates it like, and it's, it's a lot of it so they can do stuff in the off season. Um, I have another buddy who, um, pretty much has visual representations and breakdowns of this technique for this. Do you mm -hmm. give them anything like that, or even just a terminology sheet? Uh, especially for either new players or just kind of off season work. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we have our dictionary, like I said, we have our, our coverage terms, our pressure terms, you know, and those are, you talked about what's the off season look like. I go through those terms and say, Hey, this is something maybe we don't utilize that much. You know, I make sure to format that, that sheet to keep it as little as right. Cause it can grow to 200 pages overnight if you want it, you know, so I'm always cautious to make sure relative information is in that playbook. Um, and then I bombard our coaches with sheets of paper with, with definitions and details. And then I let the position coaches manipulate how they want to get that to their players. So, you know, they, some of them come up with acronyms for things. Um, you know I mean? They, they build their own rule principles off of those structures, which I'm completely fine with because that gives them that ownership within it. Um, but I feel my work as a coordinator is drawing those coaches on terminology and language and then build it. You know, you're the ones coaching the players on a daily basis, you know, build it how you need to communicate it out to the players. Um, obviously they, you know, they reference me and use me as a resource in that, but I think ultimately it gives those position coaches ownership in the scheme. Um, and then for me, I, I take great pride in this developing these guys to become coordinators you know, these are the things that you got to think about as a coordinator and, and uh, you know, gives them that ownership. And, and you know, we had a, a young outside linebacker coach, never coached defense before this year. And um, he's really good. And, and he coached outside backers. And he was he, he was like, I learned so much just in terminology and technique just by having that little bit of ownership of like, hey, what's real? Because, you know, you mean, you, you've been coaching, right? Like some things pertain to some positions, some things don't, right? So. Our outside backers, they play hook curl five times a year. So the, they don't need that full full on definition and understanding of hook curl, but they play a ton of curl flat play and force play. So there's certain things that are heavy to outside backers. There's certain things that are heavy for the nickels. There's certain things that are heavy for the corners. So within our structure, man, take what's relevant to your position group and expand upon it you know, in the simplest way possible. Okay. No, perfect coach. Uh, coaches, um, obviously check out sponsors, affiliates, all that lovely jazz. Uh, make sure you give coach here a follow on Twitter. Uh, his Twitter bio will be in the, the below. Um, and then I'm trying to think if I'm forgetting anything, like share, subscribe, all that lovely stuff. Um, and then that's another episode of the got down backer podcast. Thank you.